Hi, my name is Yin Gao and welcome to Dr. Gao's classroom. I'm a professional philosopher and I love classical Chinese poetry. I have been teaching and translating classical Chinese philosophies for many years and poetry for the last few years with a colleague of mine. I would love to share my knowledge on the subject with you. Your enjoyment is my command. Today, I'm going to start a new series on poetry, wine, and philosophy of ancient China. So far, I have made many videos on poems about romantic love. Although I still have a lot to talk about, I decided that I would like to do something different for a while. Actually, it is my collaborator, Dr. David Musgrave, suggested this new topic a couple of weeks ago. David and I have been working on translating poems about wine drinking for over three years. So, I would have a lot to share with you. In this new series, I'm going to introduce a few new poets who were the culture icons about wine drinking in the poetic tradition and the scholar official culture during Imperial China. I'm also going to translate and analyze their poems about wine drinking. To provide a bit of culture and philosophical context for the poetry on wine drinking, I'm also going to talk about the views about wine drinking from different philosophical schools. There are several poets who were already well known in the West for their fondness of wine, such as Li Bai and Du Fu. I might translate a couple of their poems. I hope you would like this new series and enjoy the videos in this series. Let me know how do you like the first video, what would you like to be covered in this new series, and which poet would you like me to talk about in the comment section down below. If you are new to my channel, please check out my other videos on classical Chinese poetry, philosophies, or medical literature. If you like the content of these videos, please click the like button and subscribe my channel. I also offer one-to-one -one online license on these subjects. So if you would like to read this original text with me, please contact me. Here's my email address. It takes me quite a bit of time to decide which poet to start this series with. Li Bai is probably a good choice. So is Du Fu. They both composed a lot of poems about wine drinking and their love for wine. However, there are already books, even videos on YouTube talking about their poems on wine drinking. I would rather not to add my piece to reinforce their images as a drunken poet. What I would like to do in this new series is to present lesser known poets as well as a more nuanced account about the role of wine drinking in both the poetic tradition as well as in the scholar official culture during Imperial China. So the poet I'm going to introduce today is Shu Shi, also known as Shu Dongpo a poet from the Northern Song Dynasty. He certainly composed a lot of poems about wine drinking and is still very much loved in contemporary China and many other Chinese-speaking communities around the world. I listed a few songs singing Su Si's poems by famous singer down in the comment section. You can check them out if you like. Now, let me talk a bit about the historical context of this poet. Shu Shi was born in 1037 AD. This was a rare peaceful time during the whole history of Imperial China. Since the Song signed a peace treaty with the Khitans in 1004 AD, the Song people had enjoyed over 
30 years of peace by the time Shu Si was born, and they continued to enjoy peace for another 90 years without major war. As you might know from my other videos about the poetry of the Tang Dynasty, it was extremely rare for the Chinese people to have a peaceful time for such a long period of time. I mean, when they had a strong empire led by an ambitious emperor, the emperor always wanted to conquer more territory. Emperors such as the fourth emperor of Qin dynasty, Yang Zheng, or the Muscle emperor of the Han dynasty, Liu Che, brought huge casualties and suffering to their subjects by raising constant wars against their neighboring countries. When they had a weak emperor like Li Yu, well, they became the conquered people and were treated like slaves. So, these 120 years of peace during the Song Dynasty is extremely rare during the long history of Imperial China. During this long peaceful time and the booming population and the economy, Arts such as poetry, painting, and music flourished. The Song policies also encouraged education and granted scholars many privileges. So the scholar class enjoyed a lifestyle that could only be dreamed about by scholars of either earlier or later time in Chinese history. They had various privileges depending on the titles they obtained by passing various levels of civil service examinations, including tax exemptions, study stipends that were enough to support a small family. If they needed to travel to academies in other regions to study, their travel and accommodation with the state-run post office were free of charge. The young scholar officials also enjoyed internship that consisted of a lot of partying, drinking, and touring around the country on public fund. There was even a public fund for the scholar officials' entertainment. It was called Gong Si Qian, or Fund for Communal Use. The scholar officials enjoy more power than the military officers of the same rank. This is why there are so much lyrics of Qi composed by the Song scholar officials describing parties as well as romantic affairs with female entertainers or Ji, because such entertainment were part of their everyday life. In the capital, huge restaurants sometimes could host thousands of guests, would entertain their guests with male and female entertainers, with singing and dancing. The scholar officials often compose poems on the spot and then hand them to the singer to sing them with a fixed melody. Even at the emperor's court, the scholar officials enjoyed a more or less equal status with the emperor when debating about national policies. For instance, in the debate about a policy reform in March 1091, the emperor Zhao Xu supported a new policy by stating that it would not affect the interests of the commoner, although it might affect the interests of the scholar class. The then Shu Mi Shi, or the military affairs commissioner, Wen Yanbo, argued that the new policy should not be implemented because Wei Yu Shi Dai Fu Zi Tian Xia. Meaning, the emperor was governing the empire with the scholar officials, not the commoners. Apparently, it was a matter of fact that the emperor was sharing the governing power with the scholar official class. 
so that he should not implement a policy affecting the scholar officials' interests. Of course, even though the scholar officials at the class enjoy immense privileges, it did not mean that every scholar officials were happy with their life because the competition for positions was even more fierce precisely because of the high social status and privileges enjoyed by the scholar officials. Now, let me talk a bit about Shu Shi. He was born into a typical scholar official family. His father Shu Xin, although did not start studying for civil service examination until he was 25 years old, was a loving father nonetheless. So after Shu Shi and his brother Shu Zhe were born, their father was working very hard on his preparation for the civil service examination while teaching his sons the Confucian classics. When Shu Shi was 19, his father traveled to the capital, Bianliang, which changed the name to Kaifeng and was located at Henan province with his two sons, for them to sit for the National Civil Service Examination. Both brothers passed the Civil Service Examination with excellent results. Xu Shi and his brother Xu Zhe acquired instant fame and became eligible to join the bureaucratic ranks. Unfortunately, Xu Shi's mother passed away soon after this. Xu Shi had to delay his political career for three years to mourn her passing according to the rules of filial priority. After three years of rather relaxed time at their hometown, the Xu family moved to the capital Bianliang. By this time, the Xu father and the sons were already known for their literary talent. Soon after they arrived at the capital, they were appointed a position each. Xu Shi was appointed as the deputy magistrate at Fengxiang County in Shanxi province. His father got a position at the court and his brother declined the job offer and stayed with their father to look after the family. The three years at Fengxiang was peaceful and relaxed with little duty to attend to. Xu Shi filled up his time by reading extensively as well as a lot of drinking parties and composing poems. And Xu Shi was very happy during this time and on his way up. He subsequently was promoted as the governor of Hangzhou and other places. Unfortunately, Xu Shi's father passed away in 1066 AD. Xu Shi left his post to mourn his father for another three years. By the time Xu Shi returned to the capital in 1069 AD, the political scene at the court had changed into a brutal struggle between the conservatives led by Sima Guang and the reformist Wang An Shi. Both of them were culture giants in Chinese literary history. Maybe I would make a few videos about them. Anyway, Xu Shi was appointed as a court historian and aligned with the conservatives. The conservative party eventually lost the emperor's favor and many of the conservative officials were either sacked from their high rank positions or demoted. Xu Shi was also demoted and assigned to be the governor of Mizhou in the north in 1074 AD. Mizhou was a remote county close to the northern frontier during the Song Dynasty. From the Walman Ridge Hangzhou in the south to the cold and deserted Mizhou, Xu Shi was depressed and turned to wine for comfort. The poem I'm going to translate expressed his feeling quite well. Now, let me read the poem in Chinese first. Chun Lei Lao Feng Xi Liu Xia Xia 
。世上超然台上看，半毫春水一城花。烟雨暗千家，寒食后酒醒却知嗟。休对故人思故国，借将心火试新茶。诗酒趁年华。The poem is made up by two parts. They are called Sang Chue and Xia Chue, or the upper parts and the lower parts. Now let's look at the Sang Chue. 春未老，风细柳斜斜。世上超然台上看，半毫春水一城花。烟雨。暗千家，春 means spring， 未 means not yet， 老 means old， 风 means wind， 细 means thin or light， but the 细 here also imply light rains， as in the phrase of 细雨。As we can see later in this poem, that rain is mentioned in the last line of this part of the poem. It is clear that the xi here implies that it is raining lightly with breeze. So David and I translate feng xi as moist breeze. Liu means willow. Xia is normally pronounced as xie in modern Mandarin. But it is pronounced as xia in Beijing Opera, so I would adopt the Beijing Opera's pronunciation to rhyme it with the last characters of the last two lines in Shang Chue. We also change the structures of this and the next lines to make them read well in English. Shi means attempt. Shang here it is used as a verb. Means climb up. Chao ran literally means transcendence. It is a phrase often associated with the Taoist practice, as detached from the secular world, for a spiritual pursuit. So David and I translate the term as Taoist rather than transcendence. Let me know what you think of this translation. If you have other suggestions. Please leave your suggestion in the comment section. Tai is a platform often attached to a tower, as shown in this painting. Such buildings were often built to commemorating for a victory or an achievement, which could later be used for ceremonial activities or entertainment. Chaoran Tai was built to celebrate a flood control project. Supervised by Su Shi at Mizhou, Sang here is used as adjective, meaning on top of something. Can means gauge. Ban Hao we translate as nip moat. Chun Shui refers to a river in the spring. Yi Cheng here is used as a measurement unit here, meaning a city's worth of something. Hua means flower, yan yu means rain haze, an means darken, qian means a thousand, jia means house. So the four lines read: Spring has not ended. A moist breeze bends the slender willow. Let's climb up the Taoist platform and get down on the nip moat. A city's worth of Flowers, rain haze darkens distant houses. 寒食后酒醒却知嗟。休对故人思故国，妾将心火试新茶。诗酒趁年华。寒食 was a festival to commemorate a loyal official named Jie Zi Tui of the Spring Autumn Period. Jie Zi Tui helped Zhong Er to get the title of the Duke of the State of Jin in 636 BCE. However, Zhong Er awarded everyone who supported him except Jie Zi Tui. 
借着推拉的仲儿 ，and retreated to a mountain with his mother. Zhong Er found out that Jie Zhitui had left him, and chased him to the mountain and tried to get him out of the mountain by setting a fire on the mountain, saying that he would award Jie Zhitui with titles and land. However, Jie Zhitui refused to come out and died in the fire with his mother. Zhong Er said he was very sorry and named the mountain after Jie Zhitui and announced that the three days around that time as a public holiday, no fire should be lit and people should eat cold food. So the holiday was named as Cold Food Festival. Some historians argue that the Cold Food Festival had nothing to do with Jie Zhitui. It was an ancient costume that people will extinguish all the old fire seed for three days and rekindle new fire seed, symbolizing the beginning of a new year. Ho means after, jiu means wine, xing means sober. Jiu xing literally means sober after drunkenness. But David and I think it might be better to interpret the term as "back to the straight and narrow," because it is followed by a shy. Apparently, the poet would rather be drunk than sobering up. Qie means yet, zhi jie means shy, xiu means don't, dui means in front of. 故人 means old friend. 诗 means miss. 故国 literally means lost homeland or just hometown. It is quite interesting that 故国 is used instead of 故乡 which literally means the homeland or the hometown. It is probably to rhyme with the character of 街茶 and 华 Although it does not rhyme with them in Mandarin, but it certainly did during the Song Dynasty. Qie means just, Jiang means take, Xin means new, Huo means fire, Shi means try, Xin means new, Cha means tea, Shi means poetry, Jiu means wine. Chen means take advantage of. Nian means year. Hua means flower. Nian Hua refers to the youth days of one's life. David and I translate it as the salad days. So the four lines read: After the cold food festival, it is back to the straight and narrow. Shy, don't get homesick. In front of old friends, now just light a new fire, try some new tea, fill your salad days with poetry and wine. It is quite clear that Shu Shi missed the life he enjoyed at the capital, or even his private post at Hangzhou and his extended family. According to the AC Chao Ran Tai Ji. Or an essay about the Taoist platform. He was quite depressed when he first moved to Mizhou, facing a huge drought, the subsequent lotus plague, and the famine, many bandits, and high crime rate. As the county governor, he had to work very hard to raise funds and get disaster relief from the central government. After three years, he managed to rebuild some of the infrastructure, set up poverty relief, caught most of the bandits and criminals, and set up an orphanage for the children who either lost their parents or abandoned by their parents during the famine. The situation improved substantially after three years of hard work. It was after this hectic period. Shu Shi repaired one of the old terraces to celebrate their achievements, and his brother suggested to name the terrace 
Taranthai or the Taoist platform. The AC Taranthai Ji also stated that it was reading Zhuangzi helped Shu Shi overcoming his depression. He learned that he had to break away from the conventional views about good and bad, happiness and suffering, and making the most out of any given circumstance. Then he would be able to achieve true happiness. So in this poem, he told us how he turned a gloomy spring day into a delightful occasion to enjoy new tea, wine, and power tree. The poem starts by painting a quite miserable day with rains and cold. The poet is missing his hometown, relatives, and friends. Then the mood is changed. He tells us that there is still a lot of beautiful flowers. Furthermore, there is new teas just harvested and new wine to taste. And most importantly, he is still young and can enjoy the pleasures of wine and poetry. Instead of moaning about what he could not have, he enjoys what he has at hand. David and I love this poem very much, especially the last lines. 十九千年华 Oh, fill your salad days with poetry and wine. Enjoy life to the full whenever you can. I think this is the reason why Shu Shi is still very much loved by many people today. No matter what happened in his life and how hard it was, Shu Shi would always find something to cheer himself up. He composed many poems about his love for wine and many other things he enjoyed. He was also a foodie. He even invented two pork dishes called Dong Po Rou or Dong Po Zhang. They look so delicious, aren't they? I told David a lot of funny stories about Shu Shi when we were translating Shu Shi's poems. So Shu Shi becomes David's favorite poet and mine too. We not only love Shu Shi's poetry, but also Shu Shi as a person because he is so relatable. I'm certainly going to make a lot more videos about Shu Shi's life and poems. I'm sure you would also fall in love with his poetry and the person he was. If you are new to my channel, please check out my other videos on classical Chinese poetry, philosophies, or medical literature. If you like the content of these videos, please click the like button and subscribe my channel. I also offer one-to-one -one online license on these subjects. So if you would like to read original text with me, please contact me. Here's my email address. Thanks for watching this video. I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.